Good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to present here. I'm a second year PhD student studying at University College Dublin. And I'm going to talk today about the use of a machine learning approach for drive-by condition monitoring of bridges. So this probably follows on nicely from Zach's presentation there. And it's not the same concept, but uh, some of the ideas are similar. So first of all, you might wonder what drive-by condition monitoring is or why we need to be monitoring the condition of our bridges at all. And I suppose to start off, anyone involved in civil or structural engineering has probably come across the footage of the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse in 1940. Uh, luckily, nobody was killed during that disaster. However, there was unfortunately a dog on the bridge at the time who didn't make it off. Uh, more recently then, there was a, a span of the San Francisco Bay Bridge collapsed in 1989. And unfortunately, somebody did lose their life there. And of course, there are huge indirect costs with repairs to the bridge and uh, delays during the repair period. Even more recently, again, then we saw uh, the I-35 bridge in Minneapolis collapse in 2007. This was a much more significant disaster, and this resulted in 13 people dying and almost 150 people being injured in that disaster. And then one that probably stands out in all of our minds more recently is this major bridge collapse, which happened in Italy in 2018. And this resulted in 43 people being killed. And uh, I think there were about 600 people left homeless due to the effects of this bridge collapse. So while some of these bridge collapses are as a result of uh, perhaps a lack of understanding or flaws during the design stage, what we're seeing now more and more is bridges actually collapsing because of inadequate maintenance budgets, uh, inspection regimes, and basically lots and lots of bridges reaching or uh, exceeding their design lives. So it is, of course, important that we do monitor our structures and understand uh, how safe they are and how they're behaving. So the idea of monitoring bridges, following up from Zach's presentation, isn't a new one. So traditionally, when we talk about monitoring, we're talking about putting sensors on the bridge, like we've seen already. So what we would call direct monitoring, putting sensors on the bridge, measuring the behavior, trying to understand how it's behaving in service. And if there's any indication of any change or structural behavior or anything that might indicate that there's some sort of damage or deterioration. More recently, we see a move towards indirect approaches. So not necessarily putting the sensors on the bridge, but putting them, uh, I suppose, on, on a vehicle or a drone or something like that. So what I'm going to talk about today is what I'm calling a drive-by technique. So putting accelerometers inside a vehicle and trying to infer something about how the bridge is behaving purely from sensors which are in the vehicle. So I won't go into a huge amount of detail on the advantages or disadvantages of either method, but uh, the direct approach is very good, gives us lots of information as Zach has shown, can give, we can really understand how the structure is behaving. But due to the, the, the cost and the, the access to bridges and the health and safety implications, it's, it's not really feasible for monitoring all of the bridges on a transport network when you might have hundreds of thousands of bridges on, on a major transport network. So that's the main reason why you see a move towards looking at you know, research in, in indirect monitoring approaches. And essentially it's cheaper than direct monitoring and it's just a, a more suitable or sustainable option for, for large scale monitoring. Now, of course, sounds like a great idea, but there are plenty of technical challenges, so it's not particularly easy to do. So various things, uh, Zach touched on environmental uh, impacts and how they change the, the response of a structure. Uh, so temperature, uh, the speed at which a vehicle crosses will influence the, the structural behavior of both the vehicle and the bridge. So the complex interaction between the two can cause problems in trying to understand how the, how the structure is really behaving. And then things that seem maybe even insignificant or, or not too important, like the surface on the road and how rough the pavement is, that can have huge implications on how much the vehicle vibrates and hence how easy or difficult it is to, to understand how the bridge is behaving purely from in-vehicle measurements. So just to give a little bit of background about the, the drive-by monitoring approach and uh, a bit of theory behind how it works, so here's a, a reasonably simple vehicle bridge interaction model. Um, we have a, a quarter car model going across a finite element representation of a bridge. And we typically would model a vehicle with, uh, in this instance, uh, a lump mass representing the vehicle body and the weight of the vehicle itself. 
and then another lumped mass to represent the weight of the axle and the wheels. So these are connected by spring dashpot systems and uh, they represent the stiffness of the, of the tire or the stiffness and damping properties of the suspension system. So to take a simple example of a vehicle crossing over a bridge, uh, here's some simulated acceleration responses from what would be measured if you were measuring the acceleration response of the axle or on the vehicle body itself. Now, looking at that in more detail and we look at the frequency content of the axle response, in this particular theoretical example, you can clearly see there's a very distinct peak at what is the first natural frequency of the bridge. So this, I suppose, shows us that from measuring inside a vehicle, you can actually pick up something to do with the dynamic behavior of a bridge. And you can actually uh, detect that purely from using sensors inside a vehicle. Now, I mentioned the, the impact of a pavement. So the, the concept here is that if there is damage in the bridge, or if something happens to it, there will be a change in this frequency or a change in the frequency spectrum. And you can see this here when you model some cracking at mid-span. But when we do include the pavement and we consider the effects of the pavement within our simulations, you can see that this frequency graph changes quite a lot. So now the, the peak has shifted over here and it's actually shifted to what's the, the first natural frequency of the vehicle, so the axle hop frequency. So now it's not quite as easy to understand how the bridge is behaving or extract the, the behavior of the bridge from that in-vehicle measurement. So what I did was I said, okay, well, rather than looking at the, the response directly on the vehicle, why don't we look at the response at the point of contact between the tire and the bridge? Now, obviously it's not very easy to measure at that point, but uh, I, did, I developed a relationship which uh, allows you to calculate or infer the contact point response purely from the in-vehicle measurements and when you have an understanding of some of the vehicle properties. Comparing the, the axle response to the contact point response then and looking at the frequency content, you can see now in the, the red here, much more distinct peaks at the natural frequencies of the bridge and very little influence at the of the vehicle frequencies on the overall measured vibration. So this is great, gives us a better way of understanding how the bridge is behaving. However, this is where the machine learning comes in Zach mentioned all of the different things that can affect the behavior and kind of affect these frequencies. So this is a, a kind of a brief overview of how the, the model works. Um, vehicle crosses over a bridge, you take some measurements, uh, for example, environmental operational conditions at the time and, and record the vibration. And in my case, uh, use that vibration to calculate the contact point response. Then during a training phase, you uh, carry out a number of vehicle passages and you train an artificial neural network to recognize how this vibration should look. So your model can now predict some sort of vibration which you can compare to what you're measuring and develop some sort of damage indicator. So does it, does it match up well? The bridge is probably behaving as you'd expect. Maybe it doesn't match up so well and the damage indicator will tell you that, okay, maybe there's something changing with that bridge. Uh, we need to have a look at it in a little bit more detail. Maybe do some more direct monitoring. So just to demonstrate the approach then, uh, the model was trained using 200 simulated vehicle passages over an undamaged bridge and then afterwards uh, subsequent sets of 100 passages of the vehicle were simulated um, using as increasing levels of mid-span cracking were modeled. This is a, a, an example of the results here. What you can see is uh, each blue dot representing an individual vehicle passage and the black line here over time representing what I'm calling an overall bridge damage indicator. So in the first 100 passages here, the bridge isn't damaged, the damage indicator is pretty close to zero, but you can see as soon as cracking is induced in the bridge, this increases and you start to see you know, a shift and a very distinct uh, change in the damage indicator that would tell you something is going on there. But haven't considered the effect of temperature yet. So when you do model temperature and how it changes the structural response, but you don't train the, the machine learning algorithm to recognize that, you can see the results are much worse. So we can't actually really detect anything. And that's basically the effects of temperature masking the, the impacts of this damage. But when you do train the machine learning model to, to recognize temperature and you record the temperatures, you can get quite a good understanding. You can actually detect the damage there, even with the, the lowest level of damage. So without getting into too much detail and results, the algorithm can clearly detect damage at varying vehicle speeds and temperatures. And it did a much more detailed sensitivity analysis and kind of what it showed was we can get very good results at high speed, which is a challenge for this approach. You need to be able to monitor at high speed if you want to do it in live traffic uh, on, on poor pavement conditions. 
and then even comparing to the, the axle response using my contact point response, what if I was to use the axle response in my machine learning algorithm, we get much better results. So just to summarize, the, the algorithm is successful in detecting both mid-span and quarter-span cracking. Contact point response is much better than the, using the axle response directly. And we can essentially get rid of the effects of temperature, measure at high speeds and on poor con pavement conditions, which are very important in terms of commercializing this approach. And during the first year of my PhD, I've uh, prepared a conference paper and two journal papers and was fortunate enough to, to win first prize for this project in uh, Engineers Ireland and Institution of Mechanical Engineers competition. So I hope to continue that going forward. So thanks for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, really uh, fascinating presentation and a uh, very, very topical subject. My, my, I want to kick off with a question, which was just to make sure I'm clear, uh, I want to say when you, you train the, the neural networks and then you sort of showing that it's got good, so, you know, you're getting good results. Have you, and maybe you said this, but I missed it, but have you driven vehicles over bridges to actually kind of test this, you know, out in the field, so to speak? So I personally haven't. Um, it's, I suppose this, there has been research done in this area over the last number of years and it, I, I've started doing lab testing and I've literally just completed my lab model. So I haven't got any results yet. Um, it's difficult to test this on real bridges because you can't just go and damage a bridge and then see if you can detect it. But there have been a few studies done where there have been, has been testing done before a bridge is being repaired. For example, if the bearings are due to be replaced, there have been some measurements taken before the replacement and after the replacement kind of in reverse. And it has been shown that this, this not the technique with the machine learning that I'm using, but that the drive-by technique does work. But part of the, the challenge in commercializing it is the, the fact that there are so many things that can influence how your bridge behaves between one time driving over and another, you know, whether it's ambient temperature or, uh, you know, if there are extra vehicles on the bridge or whatever. So, um, that's why I'm using the machine learning to try and, I suppose, extend that approach and make it a bit more feasibly uh, uh, commercializable. Interesting. I, I will, you know, watch with interest over time to sort of see how, you know, how that can, uh, if you like, go out into the field and, start, you know, pilot. It's always, piloting is always a really interesting phase. Um, I'm going to get a question from a fellow judge and then we'll go to the audience. So Dennis has a question. Yes, Rob, uh, just to clarify, um, well, maybe it's just my assumption. I was assuming you have to do this drive-by when the bridge have no traffic on, but maybe I'm just misunderstanding. You can actually do um, it while the traffic is still running. Well, ideally, this approach would be, uh, you know, install sensors on perhaps a fleet of buses, and you just they just drive around the network all day and collect data. That would be the ideal condition because you need to understand how the bridge behaves at different times of the day when there's other traffic on the bridge because. It's fair, you won't really be able to, to roll this out wide scale if you don't do it with other traffic on the bridge or if you try and control it. Uh, so it, it, it does cause challenges, but it also helps because a lot of the time, the, the dynamics of a bridge are excited by other vehicles on the bridge. So you have more loading, you have more vibrations, which helps this approach. So well, it that's can actually help. Yeah, that's precisely what I'm thinking. Because if you have a very heavy loaded uh, traffic condition, they might influence, you know, the sensors you are picking up. Uh, so it's very difficult to see, you know, like the soft. Well, maybe you can detect, you know, damage, but the amount of damage will be difficult to detect when you've got a very heavy loaded uh, deck. Whilst you know, on the soft lighter load, that you will have a different yeah. response. So you know, your monitor may be picking these bridges, uh, you know, maybe 10% damage, but it might be 10% damage only on the very light loading. When it's in a full low, it might be close to collapse. So this is what I was sort of yeah. getting I, into. I, I wouldn't be proposing to, to estimate the amount of damage. I would be proposing that this technique would be lagging. Something is changing with the bridge. We need to go and inspect it, or we need to maybe do some more direct specific monitoring on a particular structure. Okay, thank you very much. We have time for a question now. Um, I think the first audience question was, was from, was about neural, about training neural networks from Jay. 
Uh, yes, hello, sorry, it's <laughs> on Zoom, I'm Jay. My name is Julia. Thank you very much very much for your presentation. I think that's excellent. Um, I'm working on a similar approach, but using photographs. And just to confirm that what you were saying about being able to spot that change in the performance of the bridge, that's something that on our end we're finding is key as well to roll this out in industry. But what I wanted to ask you is um, when you talk about training your neural network, uh, what does your prediction look like? Is it a vibration? And if so, then what did you use for the training as your ground truth? So the I actually have a slide here. If yeah, if you can go help. back, that'll be really helpful. Um, yeah. I didn't actually put this in the presentation, but um, so the this is based on this is just showing the uh, if if we train the model to represent to predict the, the frequency content of that contact point response, which I explained. Uh -huh. In this particular case, we've trained a model and this is at a particular speed or a particular temperature and we can exactly predict it with our model. Now, obviously this is a theoretical situation, but when we start to see damage in the bridge, then there's a change. So our model is still predicting how it thinks this the structure should be behaving, but you're starting to see changes. And our damage indicator is based on the difference between what we're predicting and what our, what our actual in-service measurement is. Okay, so this is what you were saying when you said it's going to be challenging to validate by getting actual yeah. data from vehicles driving over bridges. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. That's really good. Okay. There's more questions in the chat and I'd love to, to sort of have that discussion going, but unfortunately we're out of time. Um, so I hope, again, as with many of these, I, I hope that these these really interesting discussions can continue at the end in the in the, the breakout sessions of the networking. Um, but for now, I'd just like to thank thank Robert for his uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you very much.